Hey guys, um, welcome to another live stream today with me and Noah. Um, today we're going to go over the programmer recording groups, utilizing highlight, low light, fanning, some nifty shortcuts, and then some segments and budding. And we're finally going to end with some palette recording and then, of course, Q&A after. Uh, so before we get started, though, the chat is going to be mainly used to chat amongst yourselves, but the Q and A, like, if we can make sure questions go into the Q and A, that way me and Noah know what to answer. Um, and we know what's like really important to bring up in the stream. The chat just stuff flies by, so we might not be able to see all the questions that are being asked. And with that, Noah, anything else to add? Uh, nope. Just, uh, I just want to also point out that, like the rest of the world, uh, we're pretty much stuck in our homes. So if you hear dogs barking or delivery men or lawnmowers or anything like that, just kind of have to excuse it. Uh, we are kind of following a, a, a guideline today. Uh, there will be a dedicated Q&A at the end, but if you have any questions in the meantime, we'll be kind of glancing over if we can answer something, we'll try to answer it between different topics. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, make sure you sign up for our next uh, webinar as well. You get an email to sign up for that as well. Megan, you wanna kick this off? Yeah. Let's kick off with some programmer then, because most people know about the programmer, but it's always good to do a good overview, especially if we have some newcomers in the audience. So let's go ahead and open that view, Noah, that you have with the programmer. Um, and then what the programmer is, it's the, it's what Hog calls the active editor by default. So this is where you'll start seeing what's selected, what's not selected. It's also going to show you what you're adjusting as you're adjusting. So let's go ahead and populate the programmer with some fixtures. Uh, so go ahead and type in one through nine at full. And that brought in the fixtures one through nine. You'll notice that these intensity values have a dark blue background. Um, but the dark blue background is going to signify what uh, values are currently added into the programmer. So what's really nifty about the programmer is we distinguish what's been recorded into a queue already versus what's added into the programmer very new. Um, so we have that 100%. That means we added this into the programmer. And the lights are tilt tilted a little bit because Noah did that edit fixtures trick of tilting out the fixtures by default. That way we don't have to continuously tilt them out. Um, Normally they'd be points are down. Exactly. Um, so let's not clear out our selection yet, and let's actually bring in um, the Solo Wash 2000. So let's do 110 through enter at full. Cool. And so this brought in our Solo Washes, and you can see that we've actually, de at this point, we're distinguishing between what's selected versus what's not selected because the how the user numbers are. So at the far, at the left here of the programmer, you can see that the spot 2000s their user numbers aren't highlighted in blue because those aren't the currently selected fixtures. Um, but you can see their intensity still has that blue background, again, because we've added that info into the programmer since we have recorded a queue. Once you record a queue, that inf that information will, turn, will not have any more blue background, just to signify it's already been recorded. Uh, cool. So that's really how the programmer is laid out and the differences from what you see with the dark with the blue versus not blue. And the so when you're something to pay attention to with the programmer is when you're recording only the information, only the cells that have information in it will actually get recorded. So with the so in this case, if we were to like record a queue or record a palette, it would only record intensity information. We wouldn't record any information for pan, tilt, color mixing, stuff like that, just because we don't actually have information in those cells. So in the programmer here also up at the top, there's these tabs where we have value, fade, delay, path, size, rate, et cetera. Those tabs are going to be different information that you can see while you're programming. So like if you wanted to specify a time for all of this, you could actually click on the delay tab. And then when you hit the delay tab, it's going to switch and show you what your delay would be. So if we wanted to give a delay for the wash 2000s, we can just hit time time. Or click and drag on the cells and press set. Uh, but hitting time time will put it into the command line and then we can say 5 enter. 
And now our delay time is set to five seconds and we can actually see that. And it doesn't, we do that so that it's a little bit easier to signify what information is where. That's really what the tabs at the top are for. You can also see like with table, what your current effect table is. So like if you had a sine wave attack, say sine wave assigned, that kind of stuff. So it just allows you to have one window where you can quickly see what information you have programmed at this time. With that being said, we've put some values in. Now, if we, uh, another very important tool while programming is also the blind button. And uh, utilizing the blind button allows us to hide the output of whatever the active editor is. In case that's the programmer. So when you hit blind, it's going to actually hide all the output from the active editor or the programmer on stage. So by hitting blind, we don't see anything. And then when you hit blind again, it'll come back. So this allows us to program without the audience actually seeing anything or without anyone else seeing anything. So if we hit blind, go ahead and hit blind for me, Noah. We can actually say that uh, these fixtures now go into blue. So can, can we put them in blue? Color button or get to color directory, however you want to choose blue. And then when you bring blind, and then when you hit blind again, it'll they'll come back into that blue color. Oops, they're kind of hard to see. We talked about they are being washed out based on the wash two thousands also, the spot two thousands. Just turn those down. There we go, and now they're in blue. Now we can see it. Cool. Uh, and that's really how you. To help hide from on stage. Now, what else we can do is hitting by hitting uh, is with blind. You can actually try fade. You can actually try some timings also. So by utilizing and hitting the pig button while hitting blind, it'll actually do what's called like a try queue where we put in the fade times at the same time. Um, the default global fade time is two seconds. So when you hold down pig and hit blind. It's going to fade everything in in two seconds, and because we specified that delay time earlier is five seconds, Wash two thousand didn't do anything in five for five seconds. I'm gonna just I'm gonna show that just a little easier. Uh, so I'm gonna do you can actually do a fan delay time as well. So we'll do that with the solo spots. So right now, currently, there's a zero second uh, delay time for intensity. So if you go in and you press the set key, you can type up a little box. And uh, you can type in a range that you want the uh, times to be. So I'll say two through zero through two, enter. Uh, and now I'm gonna press blind again, which will blind my programmer. And now if I press pick blind, you'll see I actually have an inside out sort of sweep for the solo spots. That's all I wanted to show. Currently, the reason why the uh, solo washes came on late is because they have that five second delay. So, if you want to set that back to zero or any value, you can. Cool. Um, and we're going to go over like specifying fanned, actually fanned out segments like that a little bit later today. Um, so, if you miss that a little bit, we can do that. Um, cool. So, that's how blind works. And that's really like blind, pig and blind is a pretty nifty programming tool, especially, like I said, if you want to try something out or if you want to bring something in on stage that currently wasn't on stage um, and just sneak it in and whatever, how, however long you want it to take. Um, that way it looks like it was there all along and it doesn't look as jarring as just that quick snap. One and now let's talk about actually taking values out of the programmer. You can always clear out the entire programmer, like empty the programmer by hitting the clear button. So if no taps clear, we're going to miss everything and it's going to just all go away. So that just completely empties out the programmer. Uh, you can always undo a clear. So if he clicks undo right now, that uh, that clear will come back. That has saved me such multiple times. times over and over again. Um, so undoing a clear is totally a thing you can do. Uh, and now if you just wanted to get rid of information from the programmer, so like maybe we actually don't want the wash 2000s in this anymore, we can actually knock them out of the programmer. So we select the fixtures first to knock them out. So one and one, 
through enter and then hit the knockout button at the bottom of the screen and that's going to get rid of all the of all this wash 2000s from the programmer now we can also if we wanted these fixtures to be at a default intensity value but leave their information inside the programmer so we want to make sure we get like a zero percent intensity into the programmer for our spot 2000s then we can we can do we can actually default these values pretty quickly um so let's go ahead and select one through nine enter and to default a value so to put it at its default at its default value inside the programmer that's when you can use the shortcut with the dot button and then the kind key so if you hold down dot and hit intensity at the same time it's going to take those to its default values and it take because we hit the kind key it takes all uh, intensity parameters to its default values uh, there is a difference between knocking out and uh, and defaulting a parameter by defaulting a parameter you actually put that value inside the programmer so you can actually just say so that zero percent is still in there by knocking out you actually get rid of the information out of your active editor or out of whatever your um or out of the programmer specifically yeah. um and that's really what i had to talk about the programmer is to knock out is so if there's any questions about the programmer or utilizing that blind button a little bit more we can take a couple real quick um we'll also point out that you can put a kind in front of that knockout button so what i'm going to do is i'm going to grab a couple of position color values and so if you wanted to just knock out one value, so I'll tell the pictures to get a full so we can see them as well. Take it down a little bit. So if I wanted to, for example, put a color in, so I will size one go. Here lights go red. He said, you know what? I didn't actually want to do that. I wanted to actually switch, switch it to uh, no color. Then I could actually say color and then press this knockout softly at the bottom of the screen. And that will remove that information from the programmer. Uh, and that's different than leaving a default value, which the default value would be white. So keep in mind that if we record anything right now, we won't be recording any color values because that information is not in our program. And we're going, so the fade offset, so like if we wanted to fade in a fan, Noah, can you go over that again? Yeah, so uh, if you wanted to do that uh, fade time, we're actually going to cover this as more specifically later, but I'll show you just kind of really quickly. There's two timing values in the console. You have your fade time. There's several timing values, but the two in the programmer are fade and delay. So fade is the, the time it takes you to get from A to B, and then delay is from the point that you execute that command that something actually happens. So you can do all that from the command line as well. So if you typed in one through nine, and you say time five, switch over to fade, uh, five, enter, that switches over the fade time specifically. So the time from A to B will take five seconds. Uh, if you want to specify a delay time, you press time twice. So if I say time time uh, two, enter, my delay time is now two seconds. So after I execute that command, it'll take two seconds for that to actually occur. Now you can do what's called a fan to delay time as well. So this is really kind of easy to show with color. So I'm gonna make the lights go red. And I'm gonna say time time, let's say zero, and I'm gonna say through, and then two enter. Uh, now, in order to see this, you have to you also enable something called fade changes. You can't do it temporarily by holding pick and pressing blind, uh, but I'm gonna enable fade changes in the programmer right now. Uh, we're going to have an entire video specifically focused on this. Uh, actually, our next video is going to be focused on fade changes as well as various different timing values. So now I've selected fade changes. I have some fade and some delay times in my programmer. I pick a new color. See, I get a left to right uh, sweep across the stage because of those delay times. They are fanned. And like Noah said, we're going to cover a little bit more of the fanning process and, fan and fanning parameters later in this video as well. That's playing through. Um, and then on top of that, so just a couple in here real quick. Basically, the order to select fixture, if you wanted to knock out, 
than a specific parameter, then yes, it's you have to select the fixtures, select the mask, and then you do the action. So then you hit the knockout button. And for people who know shortcuts, knockout button and backspace button. So backspace and an encoder wheel or backspace and a kind key. Yes, that is the same. We will be doing that in, um, we're going to go over the shortcuts in those nifty shortcut section in, in this video or in this live stream. All right, so that's just how the programmer works. Uh, I'm going to kind of take over and we're going to talk about how to record some groups. So groups is just another way of selecting fixtures. So you can select fixtures from the number pad, you know, one through nine enter, 101 through 108 enter, anything like that. You can type in those values directly. Uh, that gets old really quick, especially if you're like me and you fat finger things and you say one nine through enter. Uh, so fat fingering is a bit of a problem. So groups are your friend. Uh, in the show file, there are some groups kind of already recorded. Here's just kind of an example of how I might lay out these uh, groups, but we're going to talk about how to record them and then some various different functions that you can do with them. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and clear out my programmer. So I press the clear key. And we're going to show kind of like a hidden thing of a programmer, and that is what's called cell order. So I'm going to say one through nine, enter. And let me switch this over so you can see a little better. If you right click on this little header here, like where it says intensity, you hit show. There's a little hidden feature. There's a couple of them, but one of my favorites is the show cell order. And that'll actually tell you the order that you have selected your fixtures in. Uh, so you can select fixtures in various different orders. So you could actually do them like backwards, for example. So if I said nine through one, enter, you'll see that one, fixture number one, is actually the ninth selected fixture. Fixture number nine is the first selected fixture. You can also use your select toolbar to uh, shuffle them. So I'll go to select here at the bottom and we will shuffle. And you'll see they're all in a sort of randomized order. Uh, the reason why that's important is because that does get reported into your group. So you can have a group with a shuffled selection order. And then when you start fanning or you're flying an offset or even that fan to delay time or anything like that, it is going to take that selection order into account. So if you do select fixtures, you do need to be kind of be careful on how you select them. Uh, a common thing that I see people do is they'll do like auto palettes and they'll select their odd fixtures and then their even fixtures and they'll record a group off of that. And that can be what you need, but keep in mind that it actually selects every other fixture in that order. So it goes odds, you know, one, three, five, seven, nine, and then evens, two, four, six, eight, et cetera. Uh, it doesn't go one through nine, it actually alternates them. So do keep that in mind when you're recording groups that if you're using other groups to record new groups that it does take that selection order into account. So I'm gonna just clear that out. So to record a group, it's pretty easy. So I'm gonna uh, size this over and I'm gonna open up the group window. Uh, basically, whatever you have selected in your programmer, that is what gets recorded to the group. So if I said one through nine, here I am fat fingering again, one through nine, enter. You can see the fixtures are selected in my programmer. They are appearing here. I hit record and then I can choose my destination. I can also type in the number I want. So if I wanted to say uh, group 76, which is just the next one available, I can choose specifically uh, the number I want to record it to, or I'm going to undo that. You can hit record and then actually choose the destination. So if I were to touch in my group directory here, it will uh, be applied there. And then if you want to, uh, what's called quick name that, anytime that you record any function in our console, queues, groups, palettes, any things like that, uh, you can double tap the set key. And what that'll do is that'll bring up what's called the quick name menu, and then you can call this uh, whatever you want. So you double tap set, you can bring up the quick name. And oops, it's not a keyboard, it's not working. Oh, there it is. So I can call that all spot, for example. Uh, so I'll go ahead and make it a shuffled group as well. So I'm going to hit select, hit shuffle, and then I'm going to record this as well. So once again, I'm going to hit uh, record, choose my destination, double tap set, and I'm going to call this spot shuffle. Not spots, oops. So yeah, and so uh, that's just kind of how you record a group, pretty easy. 
whatever you have in your programmer, that's what gets reported. And now uh, do keep in mind that if I said uh, 101 through, tell those pictures to go full, and then one through nine at full. Uh, if I have multiple bits of information in my programmer right now, see how the solo washes, there's a white background. That means that they are not currently selected. There's data for them in the programmer, but they're not currently selected. So if I were to record a group right now, the only thing that would be recorded would actually just be the solo spots, which is this one through nine here. So do keep in mind that what you have selected specifically uh, will show up in, or will be recorded into a group. Uh, something that I tend to recommend people do when I press clear is to use the uh, highlight function. So if I turn on highlight, what that does is that takes my selected pictures and it brings them to full. So if I were to say uh, one through nine, enter, what I see on stage right now, switch that over, uh, what I see on stage right now is also what's going to be recorded. So if I were to say subtract out number five, so I minus five, enter, I can see, oh, I've got uh, pictures on the left, pictures on the right. I don't have picture number five. And once again, reference my programmer and also just by using highlight, I know what it is that I'm about to record to a group. And we'll just go ahead and record this anyways. We'll just call this uh, minus five. So put it up set. And that's how you work group. Cool. Um, so Alan had a quick question about if I, if you set an effect by using a group and no longer need slash want the group, if you delete the group, does it affect the effect? Does it affect the effect? No, it does not affect the effect. A, a, a and an E effect. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, it doesn't affect the effect because uh, we record the reference to the fixtures instead of the group itself. Right. Groups are never referenced. Uh, unless you're using like a macro or something, they're pretty much never referenced. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, so, I do want to kind of talk about uh, highlight and low light really quickly. So uh, by default, what highlight does is it does take your pictures and it brings them to full intensity. So I'm going to turn it uh, back on real quickly. So turning highlight on. And uh, by default, if I said one through nine, enter. My lights come on. Now keep in mind that the intensity information does not show up in the programmer. So I haven't actually told the pictures to go to full. If I were to record this to a queue or a palette or anything like that, it actually would not record the intensity information. So highlights really handy because I can see what my lights are doing, where they're positioned, uh, gobo arrangements, zoom, focal points, things like that, but not actually record intensity. So it allows me to see the fixture without actually recording that data in. Uh, there is also a function called low light as well. So what that means is that fixtures that are on or have a value in the programmer, but they haven't, uh, but they themselves are not selected, they will then go to the low light palette. So uh, what I could do for that is I'm going to close the group directory is I'm going to go ahead and open up my intensity directory. And this is uh, default palettes. So these are palettes that do come in with auto palettes. So you can get these uh, 11 palettes really easily. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this palette number four, this 30%, and I'm going to say right click and hit set as low light. So right click, set as low light. And so now that palette, there should be a little L in it right now, it means that fixtures that um, are given a value uh, in the programmer will go to low light if they're not specifically selected. So what I'll do is I will take these fixtures and pick them in a color. And uh, if I hit next, oops, all. Close them up. So now if I hit next and I cycle through my fixtures, you'll see that the fixtures that are not selected uh, will actually go to the low light value, which in this case is a 30% value. And then I'll hit all again to select all of my fixtures. And those are keys that are on the, on, uh, the top right part of the console. So there's the next key, the next through your fixtures, and then the all key. Uh, that does keep your selection order taken into account. So if I 
were to say select the fixtures from that shuffled group that we used earlier. I hit next, it'll actually next in a random order. So do keep that in mind. Okay. Um, so Megan, do you want to talk about uh, fanning? Yeah, um, real quick though, just because I see in the chat, and uh, well, really in the Q&A, that there's a couple of people asking, how do you colorize your group directory? How do you colorize your group directory? Yeah, uh, just, yeah. Just so one, one cell. Yeah, so what you do is you basically just right click. So uh, we'll switch over to the right monitor view. So if you right click, you can uh, basically choose a color. You can also drag across multiple cells, right click, and then choose a color. So I'll put you in the right view. Uh, unfortunately, there's a couple of sub windows in the console that uh, don't show up in our recording software. So I can switch over to a specific view to get those sub windows pulled up. So once again, you can just right click and pick a color or you can uh, you know, drag across several and right click and pick a color. Uh, you can also, you guys might be wondering how they are fully colored by default. They actually are uh, not. They actually look like this little outline here. So if you go into the options of that directory, this little checkbox here, and then you say uh, color code entire button that'll switch it to the full uh, color size essentially uh, you can also change the colors by going into grid view and if you go into this greater list view you can also change the colors here as well so uh, you can uh, press set and then you can change the color from this view as well uh, if you don't have a mouse connected to your console there's also a shortcut for that and that is pig set so pig set is like our right click, right click key for most functions on the console. So uh, if you were to uh, touch on that, I'll, it's not going to work on these uh, screens specifically that I have. Uh, but if you were to touch on it and you press pig and you press the set key, that'll be able to uh, right click and then you can choose the color that way. So if you're on an actual console that has touch screens built in, you can use that if you don't have a mouse. Cool. Um, and then one more thing before we jump away from highlight low light um when there's a couple questions on how to make your own custom highlight palette uh or if someone was funny and changed their custom highlight palette and put a prism rotation in it um which may or may not be exactly what you want so whenever you're making a custom highlight palette you have to make sure it has all of the parameters that you want in it so um, I see there's a couple in here that said there's no intensity when you set this because there's probably not intensity inside that palette itself. Um, so if we wanted a custom highlight palette to be all our fixtures on, or so we want fixtures on and in blue, for example, um, no, no, can you select all your fixtures or whatever fixtures you want? Real quick, and this Jeez. is going to. One through nine. One through nine, and then they're at full. So we have to specify that they're at full. And then, um, cool, we'll actually just have them in red here for a custom highlight palette. Um, so then you press record, and we're gonna record, we're gonna record this just in the intensity directory. You could do this in any directory. When you press record, um, you, you need to make sure that you actually mask out that per in information. So we're gonna say intensity and color. That way we make sure we grab all the information that we want inside that palette um, and then press on one of the cells inside the intensity directory to record the palette. Once you have the palette recorded, you're going to right click on it. Kind of like if we were giving it a color and then set as highlight palette. And now, once you toggle highlight, turn it off, turn it back on, that'll be the new highlight. So five enter and then I just press highlight. Yeah, and then so now you can see that we don't have that info inside the programmer. We only have it. It's just because highlight is turned on. So now anytime we use highlight, it'll be that red color. Um, cool. And that that's how you can actually do that. Uh, do that for the uh, for the palette itself, or set your custom highlight. Same thing for custom for I know Noah went over doing this custom low light, but that's the exact same thing. Um, except you choose set as low light. My the only thing that I like to do with the low light is also put them in a random color that I usually don't use in the show file. 
that way it's I can quickly see like the intensity can sometimes get a bit muddy because my fixtures are already at 30%. So I just like using an actual color instead. Uh, cool. And then uh, so the reason we were going to talk about highlighting the light kind of at the end of the video, or we we're going to talk about low light at the end of the video and how to make a highlight and a low light palette. That's just because we were going to talk about how to record a palette first. Uh, but the question did get bring up uh, is it per type or per fixture? Uh, it should actually be a per fixture palette when we record it in this regard. Uh, so there's only values for the solo spots that got recorded. So if we were to say select your uh, solo washes, uh, they would get recorded or they would uh, not listen to that palette because they didn't have data to listen to in the first place. So you see, my solo washes are actually at full and 100% with highlight on versus them being red. So you can counteract that if you hit record and you press the global or the per type key, depending on what type of palette you want to create, uh, you can just make that a uh, globalized palette for all of your fixtures. And like I said, it's a, and like Noah said, it just it kind of depends on the palette you're recording. And you can also have multiple highlight and low light palettes. I sometimes will switch them over between if I'm programming or if I'm actually doing a show, I might use highlight every once in a while to kind of get me out of jail. So a lot of times I'll have like a show highlight and a show or a programming highlight and low light, and then a show highlight and low light to kind of get me out of jail every once in a while. Yeah. Cool. Um, and with that, we're going to keep going. Um, just a reminder if you miss anything, we are recording this and it'll be up within a couple days, probably after we're done live streaming so that we can, um, so that we can keep going and you guys can go back and reference exactly what we're doing in case we covered something way too fast. And with that being said, let's talk about fanning a bit. Um, so fanning is always fun and there's a couple different ways you can fan. So let's, let's just show what, what fanning does. So go ahead and select one through nine at full. And since they're already tilted down stage, we don't need to worry about that. But go ahead and hit the position button. So by fa what fanning is going to do is it's going to spread out the parameters as we hold down fan and spin the encoder wheel. So Noah's going to hold on the fan button and then spin that pan encoder wheel, and it'll start moving the spreading the fixtures out when we fan. It's just a quick way to get lights to spread across the stage and to spread and uh, to get things programmed pretty easily evenly. So when you're holding down fan, you might notice at the bottom of your screen, you actually have these options here at the bottom um, where it says normal, start, and center. This is how the fan is actually going to be applied. Let's go ahead and open that programmer window too so that we can see what's going on. So when you hold down fan, by default, the normal is selected. And so what that's really doing is it's saying going, it's kind of going from the middle of your fixture selection and then spreading your, your values up and out on either side. So that's why they, when we sp spin one way, they spread out evenly and we spin the other way, they spread in evenly. Now we can take our, our pan back to default really quickly by using that dot button. So hold down dot and spin that second encoder wheel for me. And that's going to just take them back to zero degrees pan. So again, that's taking it back to its default value. Now, if we wanted these fixtures to fan from the start of our fixture selection order, you can hold down the fan button, this time choose start. And then once you have start, when you spin that second encoder wheel, we'll, lead, we'll have that base of our fan be the first fixture in our se fixture selection order. Because we've selected the fixtures one through nine, that our fixture selection order starts at fixture number one. And then end will do the opposite. So end will have the fixture start, start the fixture selection start at the end and then go backwards. Um, so you'll see once we select end, the last fixture stays the same. Uh, something I did want to point out, if you are on Hogcore PC and you're using the virtual panel, uh, you can hold a key down by holding down the shift key on your keyboard. So uh, if you wanted to hold down a button, so I'll hold down like the backspace key here, I can either press it 
So as soon as I click off of my mouse, it lets go. But if I press it and I hold down a shift key on the keyboard, it keeps that key held down. And you can then press another button and then release the shift key to release the keys together. So if you are doing a command that you would normally press and hold on the console, you would use a shift key on the keyboard if you're using Hot Core PC. Um, and that's how the buttons work. Center can be like a V shape with that fan option. So center kind of splits your selection in half, your fixture selection in half, and then applies its mirror out. Um, so if you do it on tilt, it's really easy to see you start getting like a V shape instead. You'll start getting a V shape instead of it being linear. Linear. And that's just like how you can fan with the encoder wheel and the fan button. So where fan gets really powerful is you can actually directly enter fans. So if let's go ahead and hit clear and we're going to do an example of making the UNOs go from cyan to magenta. Um, so let's select the UNOs 301 through at full. And then tilt them a little bit downstage. That way we can see them uh, just because I keep saying it. Three, uh, so number through enter is a shortcut to grab um, all the fixtures inside that numer inside that numerical without a numerical break. So 301 through enter grabs 301 through 330. And so it goes towards the fixture type break or the numerical break, whichever one comes first. Just in case y'all missed the last last week's episode, last week's uh, live stream. Cool. So we're going to actually fan this, like I said, from magenta to cyan. So let's go ahead and dial up the saturation to 100%. Um, and I know these numbers because I was actually programming yesterday, and I know my hue numbers for this. So if we want to directly enter this hue, this hue, we can hold down set, spin the wheel for hue, and then type in. We're going to type in. Um, what are they? We're going to type in 321 through 175, enter. And that just is going to evenly spread out our hue values across, and it went the opposite way that it was supposed to. Well, we got a rainbow, though. It's <laughs> fun. Um, I'll do, uh, I'll do uh, 0 through 120. It's not yeah, zero, I mean, 0 through 120 will get red to... So if you type in, so you select the cells, you can either do this in the program or you can hold down the set key and spin that hue encoder and then type in what you want. So if I said zero through 120, uh, so zero through 120, enter, you'll get that sort of red into yellow into green. So if you're wondering where you were getting those degree values from, I'm gonna open up the color picker. Uh, in the color picker, if you think of kind of the top part there, the north part, uh, that's zero degrees, and that's going to 120 degrees, which is about a third of the circle, 360 degrees in a circle, 120 is about a third of that. So we're basically taking our fixture selection and spreading it from the zero value of red all the way to the green value of 120 degrees, uh, and all the fixtures are spread evenly. Um. Yeah, and so that just makes it really easy to get your fans into exactly what you want. Now, there is also, I know we talked about fanning our delay and our fade time a little bit earlier, uh, and we could uh, kind of did a bit of a long way where we hit time, five, enter, gave us a five second fade time, and then time, time, zero through two, enter, gave us our delay time. What you can really do to shorten that up, just to, since we're throwing in shortcuts and trying to get, tr trying to make our programming a little bit faster, is you can actually do that in one keystroke. So we can say our fade time is going to be one second. So we can hit time one, and then you hit time again to specify that delay time. So then we can say zero through three enter. And now we've applied a fade time of one second with a delay time of zero through three. Um, so if we turn on, if we turn off, turn on fade changes and then hit blind, it's going to apply in that in that timing we just did. So that it's nice and fanned out. Cool. Um, and that's how we can, we can fan that way. And so to tie it back to what Noah was going over with the selection order, your fan is always gonna be applied into your selection order. So because we selected our fixtures 
in 301 through 330, they got to apply, it got to apply that way. Um, now, if we wanted to apply this fan to evens then odds, we can select the, can we go into those groups, Noah? And then select the evens and the odds of the UNOs. We can select the evens and then the odds. And now if we were to go and fan our tilt, Uh, fan tilt. Yep. Fan our tilt. Oh. We'll see that it's going to with a normal fan. Sorry. Okay. You'll see that it gets applied in a in a way in a different order than just straight across now. Because we selected our evens and then we selected our odds. So and you can also see in the programmer that our selection order is not numerically. So it's not 301 through 330. It's evens and odds or odds and evens. Um, any questions about fanning guys? Before we go on and Noah's going to walk y'all through a lot of the shortcuts. Uh, yeah, so various different shortcuts doesn't look like, uh, there's any questions? Uh, there was a feature request in here. Once again, if you have a feature request, uh, put it on the forums. Uh, that's the best place if you have a, an idea. You can also join our beta group. So if you want to be involved in the beta program and see our software before it comes out, you can test it and get feedback on it as well. So that's really the best place to uh, uh, request a feature. If you have some sort of syntax uh, preference that you'd like us to uh, implement into the software, that's the best place to do it. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so we're going to talk about a couple shortcuts. Uh, we've actually talked about uh, several of them all, kind of already. Uh, so, I'm going to kind of go through the list. So, let's say one through nine at full. Uh, the uh, two shortcuts that I tend to use a lot are the uh, flip shortcut and the um, max and minimum value. So, the flip is I'll go ahead and tilt my pictures up and I'll pan them over a little bit to the left. Uh, if I hold down the minus key, and then I spin an encoder that is a positive or negative value uh, to the opposite direction. So I'm going to spin my pan encoder to the left. It's going to keep that value from zero, that distance from zero, which in this case is 48 degrees. And it's going to go either positive or negative. So uh, this is handy for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's good because if you need to have some pictures go one way and other pictures go another way. So if I said select uh, odd, now I've got my odd picture selected and I'll hold minus and spin it over. Got myself a good cross pretty easily. Uh, this is also kind of handy for recording positions. So I'm going to reselect these fixtures. I'm going to reset the position value. So holding period and pressing the position key will reset all position values. Uh, and this is also kind of handy because if I do fanning, fan out my fixtures, too much there. Uh, I might call that a group, and so I call that a position palette. So I can hit record, and I can call that a position palette. And then a lot of times, if I hold down minus and I spin my pan encoder, that right there could also be a very useful position palette. So sometimes just simply uh, flipping around your pan or tilt values can get you uh, different combinations of uh, palettes or different positions pretty easily. Uh, so the next shortcut is the plus key. So if you uh, hold down plus and you spin an encoder, it's going to take it to the highest value it can go. Now, in this case, for PAM, uh, it's going to take it to a highest value, which is 270 degrees. If I spin it all the way to the left, it's going to go all the way to negative 270 degrees. It is taking that time into account because the moving lights do have to take physically, physically time to move. Same thing for tilt. I can tilt it all the way up, tilt it all the way down. So a really handy way that if you know you need the maximum value, uh, it's really handy for things like zoom, uh, or intensity or saturation, things where usually zero or 100% are a common uh, thing that you need to go to. The plus key is a really handy tool so you don't have to wheel up your uh, encoders every time to get to that value. Uh, so once again, holding period and pressing the encoder will reset it to the default value, which we talked about earlier. And then holding backspace and pressing the encoder or the kind key will remove that value from your programmer or your active editor. Now we haven't talked about um, active editors just so much yet because you can actually shift your programmer to be another editor. You can make a palette be an editor or something like that. So you can add or remove data from the palette really easily. So that's what we really talk about uh, what that is for. 
We select these fixtures. Um, uh, another shortcut was the set shortcut. So uh, we actually did cover this as well. So if you hold down set, you can uh, type in a value directly on the encoder. And you can also do the silver button, which we talked about in the last video. But if you press the silver button, we go into the preferences window. So I'm going to close this. Uh, on the virtual panel, you don't have this uh, option. So on the hardcore PC uh, panel, you don't have this, uh, but you can still hold set and nudge an encoder to type in the value that you want. Uh, but if you go into your preferences window, and go to the programming tab, there's the encoder rule button options. A lot of the shortcuts that I just mentioned, uh, you can actually uh, do from that silver button on the uh, console or the hardware, whatever kind of device that you have. Uh, so I prefer the set key just because I don't like holding set and touching the encoder. Megan, I know that you prefer the adjust by one key, but you could also do uh, maximum minimum, negative positive. So that's the same thing as holding the plus or the minus key down. Uh, and then you can also do what's called fine mode, which I haven't covered yet. But fine mode, uh, if you hold down the pig key and you adjust a parameter, I want to get finer control of it. So if I wanted to uh, say, you know, line my pictures up perfectly with the stage. So I'll uh, zoom it in. So if I'm having a hard time kind of lining my pictures up, right, it's a little too sensitive. Um, I can hold down the pig key. And then if I spin that wheel, I get finer control, a much, much uh, lower control essentially of the uh, uh, perimeter that I'm adjusting. So that if I need to get to an exact specific place, I can do that. Uh, you can also turn down your sensitivity. So if I go into preferences, go to sensitivity. If you feel like the encoder wheels or any of the wheels in the console are too sensitive or not sensitive enough, you can uh, tone down the um, sensitivity uh, in the preferences window as well. Here in the program. Um, yeah, so that's kind of some shortcuts. Anybody have any questions about shortcuts before we move on to a really cool feature of the console, which is segmenting and budding? Um, awesome. I want to kind of say why my favorite is address I one real quick. And then that way, if people think of questions, they can ask them. Um, I like adjust by one because it's the only one without a keyboard shortcut on there. So you can, um, so if I need to go through, like I do, I also do a lot of media server programming. So if I need to go through content one at a time, it's a lot easier with that with that silver button rather than spinning the encoder wheel itself. Or else I fly by all of the media folders and all of the media files that I need. Um, So this is the default behavior. If you press the silver button, it goes by one real world value. It's really handy for gobos because you just switch between one gobo to another. Uh, you can also do it for things like pan and tilt values. So if I press the tilt encoder, I'm clicking up by one. If I hold down pig and I press it, it goes the other way, which is handy. It all comes down to your personal preference. Mm -hmm. It does. I do a lot more media server programming than I do lighting programming. So that's also why it's become like my default go-to. Um, well, well, real quick, I see there's a question in there on how do you program the user defined keys for shortcuts. We are going to do a video over how to do the command and kind keys. I promise it's just not in this video right now. Um, and then just before we keep, before we go, since I asked for questions. Is there a way to have pan on a fader and tilt on a separate fader? So that's more comes down to like actually having that programmed like that. Um, but yes, there is a there is a way. I don't think we want to get into that right here right now. No, we'll cover that. We can video. cover that in the playback video. But the short answer is you would record a scene or a cue that has uh, just pan information, and then have a cue or a scene that has just tilt information. So you want to separate those out. You would record them onto your master and then in your playback options, you want to enable what's called IPCB crossfader on the fader option. And if you rock the fader to the either up or down, you can crossfade into that uh, QR scene or out of that QR scene. So, yes, there is a way to do it. Yeah. 
And like I said, we briefly talked about it. Um, Ryan asked, since there isn't a time palette, what's the easiest way to utilize timing? Let's cover that in the dedicated Q&A that we can show you a little bit more. And same with Alan's question on how, how we can make macros. Um, remember, there is going to be a dedicated Q&A. So because I have these marked as we will answer these. They're just, we're going to wait for a little bit and keep going to segments and budding now. And our next video is uh, titled Pigs, Palettes, and Punting. So we're going to talk about how to make time palettes, how to make various different types of palettes, and then how to use them to bust essentially using fade changes. So it's one way to bust, but it is, is a one way to get it if you don't have a lot of time. Uh, so we're going to definitely cover that in the next video. And with that being said, let's go ahead and cover segments and bedding. There, it, it's one of a, it's a very strong feature on the console. Um, we're going to start with segments, and what segments is going to do? It's basically going to say, uh, allow us to break up the picture selection. So I like to do this on. So what it's going to do is, especially when we're fanning, it's going to say how many fixtures are we going to fan across before we repeat our fan. So uh, let's select one through nine at full. And then at the very bottom of the screen, there's a segments button. Click on segments and we're going to select segments of three to set our segment size to three. So now when we fan our pan, what it's going to do is fan across the first three fixtures and then repeat that fan. So we'll see that the first three fixtures do the same fan, the next three do the same fan, and the next three do the same fan. So that, again, it just helps us to say, hey, I want this fan to apply to every three fixtures. Or you can say, change this to be every two fixtures, every four fixtures, just change your segment size to whatever fixture you want. Uh, you can also use segments to say, I want, I want to select every third fixture at this point. So we can hold down group and hit next. And we can start selecting the next every third fixture and then if we hold down group and hit next again we select the next set of thirds and the next set of thirds uh, so this just helps us go helps us say every third fixture let's grab this or if you needed to grab every fifth fixture let's grab this um, so it just really helps to helps to make quick fixture selections at this point now inside segments there's also this option called next by segment which will allow us, instead of grabbing every third fixture, it grabs the whole segment at a time. Um, so now that next by segment's turned on, we can hold down group and hit next and we grab the first segment, then group and next again, we grab the next and then group and next one more time and we grab the last one. Um, so that's really how next by segment and segments can be used for actually just selecting fixtures and then for applying your fans. Again, set everything is selection order based. So if we were to shuffle our fixture selection at this point uh, and then we hit group and next we wouldn't grab the first three lights of our fixture of our selection uh, in our visualizer here we'd grab the first three lights based on the selection order so ju just reiterating that selection order does play a huge factor when you're programming in hog so that's how segments work. Um, when you're when you're adjusting your segments and you're buddying and you want them to go away, they don't clear when you hit clear. You actually have to go and turn them off yourself uh, by default. So to turn off your segments, you just go click on the segments button again and then hit no segments and that'll turn it off. Uh, and you can see your segments goes back to saying the actual segments button instead of what your segment size was and your buddy size was. So now let's go to segments and let's turn on buddying. We're going to turn on a buddying of three. Um, what buddying is going to do, it's going to say, how many fixtures do you want to treat as one fixture when you fan? So let's hit one, one through nine at full again. And then uh, pan your fixture and then fan your pan. Well, it's fun to say, I mean, isn't it? It's always the funnest to say. So when you're fanning your pan, you can see that the first three fixtures are acting the same and the next three are acting the exact same and the next three are acting the same. Um, that's because we're, we basically said, how do we uh, divide this fixture selection up to 
fit to equal segments. So, well, equal segments because of our fixture selection. But so the first three lights are acting the same because our body size is three. The next three are acting the same and the next three are acting the same. Um, and that's really how, how we use, I mean, that's how to use budding. And that applies to it however you're entering your fan. So whether or not that's fanning with the fan button or using direct entry to type in the fan, um, it all does it the same. It all utilizes the segments and budding. And then we're just we're using position, but you can fan any parameter or any kind of combination of this. So uh, this is handy that if you wanted to do, say, a, you know, a color sweep between some different colors, you can uh, go into color, set my saturation to full, and once again, I will hold down fan and set my hue encoder, oops, fan and hue encoder. And now I can choose kind of what range of colors I want to uh, have for my fixtures. And what's really cool about fan is once you have them set, like we have it set here to be these three values. If you just want to, you like this distribution, but you want to like go around that color picker now, you can just spin that hue encoder wheel without holding that fan, and it's just going to move those values around that that color picker. So you don't you don't have to continuously hold down fan to try to get the color. Once you have the distribution correct which you can see here based on where the crosshairs are on your color picker, you can actually just move and keep spin that hue around and start picking out colors that way. Yeah. And then let's, so we do have some compound fixtures here. So let's talk a little bit about the compound fixtures in the back. So that's our LED bars because compound fixtures are fun and act a little bit different. Um, what compound fixtures are, are fixture types that are made up of other fixture types. So LED bars are the most basic example of this, where you have just RGB cell after RGB cell after RGB cell. Um, there's also some other more complex fixtures like PEX, quad, solapix, where you have those individual cells inside a fixture. Um, and then like the, that fixture has master pan and tilt, for example. And then also media servers are also another example of compound fixtures, but like we have our RGB bars in here. So let's deal with these. Um, let's go ahead and turn off budding. So hit no budding. And so with, by default, the LED bars are going to act just if we had, if we had normal LEDs in here. So RGB LEDs. Um, so if you hit the color, we already have color, take your saturation up to hundred percent. And then fan your hue, they will start to individually each grab, each get a color. We're not doing it a whole bar. Now, compound fixtures or any fixture that uses dotted user numbers have this nifty feature called buddy parts that you can apply. So once we go back into, we'll default our hue first by dotting that encoder wheel and then turn on buddy parts inside the budding menu. And now when you fan your hue, that's going to make every whole number be treated as its own fixture. So now when hues fanned, we actually get the whole bar. We don't get the we don't get each individual cell at this point. This feature is each whole number. Yeah, so each whole number. No, no, you're fine. Um, so each whole number. So we are actually fanning across 401, 402, 403, not all the parts inside. This gets to be a little bit more important once you're dealing with like pan and tilt type fixtures uh, or fixture, or you want to, you have like those pancake wash lights, like the solo picks or the solo wash 19s, where you want to, instead of fanning across each individual cell inside the light at this time, you want to fan across the whole fixture. So you want each fixture to be a solid color. Um, that's when buddy parts really comes into play and it's really nice to use. And that's that's what I got for segments and budding. And Noah's going to take you through recording palettes, uh, some basic recording palettes. So one thing I also just wanted to briefly touch on is that you can combine those together. So if you could do say a segment of, we'll just do a segment of two, and do a, say a buddy of four, you can combine segmenting and budding together to get various different combinations. So now I'm on the fan. Hue, 
Oops, I hold it down. Uh, oops, I'll do a segment of four. When you do a center fan with a segment of two, it doesn't work because they actually are both going up at the same value. So if do something higher than two. Now, if I hold down the right key, now you see that I've got every other fixture. The reason why is I turned off buddy parts and I have every four fixtures buddy together, which is half of an LED bar. And then every, uh, I have a segment of four, so every sort of 16 fixtures, because four times four is 16, uh, it would repeat that segment. So you can get a kind of like an alternating effect by combining your segments and your budding options together. And then, uh, now that we've kind of talked about how to fan and how to get all these different values, we're going to talk about how to record these two different uh, palettes. So there are several different directories in the console. So I'm going to close all and press clear. Uh, so directories really is just any window uh, that has a bunch of items in it. So like there's your group directory, you have your intensity directory, color directory, um, beam, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, groups are not referenced. So if you change a group or you update a group, it doesn't get changed elsewhere. Uh, but palettes, on the other hand, do. So I'm going to close my uh, group directory. I'm going to open up the position directory. There are some default or some positions that are already in this show file that we recorded earlier. Uh, but, uh, if you wanted to record a position palette, the information has to be in your programmer and you record and you choose your destination. Something to keep in mind is that the, each directory has what's called a kind mask. So a position directory will only take position data. The intensity directory will only take intensity data, color, color, being, being, et cetera, et cetera. Now you can override that with what we call kind masking. So you can change the mask, what you're filtering into this, the uh, position or to the palette. Uh, but by default, the position directory will only take position values. So let's go ahead and record a couple of uh, positions. So I know there's some recorded, but we're not gonna worry about those too much for right now. And uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say one through nine at full. Oops, one through nine at full. And uh, we wanted to record a position for that downstage singer. This is where we can use that fanning option. So I will tilt my fixtures up and I will hold down fan and switch to a normal fan. And oh no, look what happens. Looks like my fixtures, I forgot to change my segmenting over. So I'll go ahead and set my segments to no segments and no budding. There is an option in your preferences that if you press clear, it resets your segmenting and budding. We just don't have that enabled on the show file. So I'll reset that position, and now if I hold down fan, there we go, looks pretty good. And then I'm also going to do a center fan on tilt, so I'm going to switch over to center, tilt my pictures up a little bit, and there we go. Got myself a pretty good position on that singer. So if you want to record something into a directory, all you'll do is hit record. Just like you would record a group, you can either type in the number, so I'll just say position, uh, 46, or I can just touch that position on the screen. And once again, I can uh, quick name this. So if I double tap the set key, I can quick name and I can call this downstage center. Uh, there are a couple of different palettes, and we're going to actually talk about the different types of palettes in the next webinar, but we do just want to briefly cover how to record a palette in the meantime. So uh, now this palette has been recorded. Uh, let's take a look at it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it. So by holding down the open key on the panel and then touching on position 46, uh, you'll see this window comes up. Now this window looks very, very similar to the programmer window. Uh, that's because it, it basically is. This is a, an active editor. And you can see in this uh, position palette, only the solo spots position data was recorded. So uh, even though I had in my programmer previously intensity information, only position data was actually recorded because we recorded it to the position directory. Uh, so that's how you basically record a palette. Uh, anyone have any questions about palettes? Is, uh, the next video is specifically focused on um, palettes and how to record the different types of palettes. There's per type, there's global. We also have what's called reference palettes and direct palettes, and then we have kind masking and various functions like that. So we do have a, a video that is specifically focused on that, but we just wanted to kind of cover how to do the basic part of it uh, at the end of this video.
So uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, we're going to kind of move into the Q&A part. We're at, right at about one hour. So if you have any questions, uh, we can go ahead and answer those in the meantime. So Alan, Alan said a couple, asked a couple of times about report, how we like to handle recording color palettes with fixtures that use the CMY and have a color wheel. Um, I, I personally keep just knock out the color wheel part so that I can, if I need this to combine them, I can. Uh, so like I can have, like, if I need to combine, get a, like a really nice deep red and my fixture light doesn't get killed by it. I can combine a red mix with my red color wheel. Um, that's what I like to do. I do a lot of, I do more theater based though, whenever I'm programming. So it's, those colors are kind of important and able to be able to over, overlap it. I don't know if Noah has an opinion about it. Uh, it just depends. Uh. Yeah, it just depends on the fixture <laughs> and how I'm doing the show. Uh, sometimes I like to delineate them. Usually when I do my color palettes, you know, I do about 10 preset colors, a couple of uh, color temperature palettes, uh, and then I usually do uh, each individual slot. So I usually do keep this for my color mix values. I usually have the slot value set to open, uh, but then I also have additional palettes that will put either full color slot or half color slot. And so if I wanted to pick a color and then add in a slot, I could just touch two palettes to do it that way. Um, I don't generally, I like to have as much as many options as I can. Cool. Um, so Anthony had asked if it works the same for hex. I'm assuming you're talking about the buddy parts option. And yes, buddy parts would work the exact same for our hex fixtures, where dot is the master, dot one through dot six are the cells. And then um, if you turned on buddy parts, when you fanned your color, it would only, it would go across each whole fixture instead of each individual cell. Uh, Stuart asks a good question. And uh, how do you copy the values of one fixture to another? Will that work for masking? So uh, that's a really, really good uh, question. I actually do macros for this a lot of times. So let's go ahead and open up the programmer window. I'll say one through nine at full, and then also just do a little bit of a color here, and let's get a little creative. We'll do a segment of three and do a little bit of fanning. And let's do a normal fan. So if I've got these fixtures, let's say I want to copy them over to other fixtures. So what I can do here is I can say one through nine, copy to one oh one through uh 118. And now those fixtures uh, have been copied over into, uh, or all the data from the programmer has been copied over to those fixtures. Uh, now they're not tilting, and the reason why is because the default tilt for the soil spots was 45 degrees, which we set in the last video. Uh, but I just went ahead and, and tilted them up. So that works for like effects and uh, pretty much any value. Oops, you guys can't see my screen. There you go. Uh, so once again, I'll do that again. So one through nine at full. Do a little bit of fanning. So like, let's say I like this color fan, right? I can say one through nine, and I say the copy to, and I type in what I want to copy those values to. So one and one through one one eight, enter, and then I will set the pictures up. So now I've copied that information over. Uh, that works in both the programmer and in palettes. So if I or to uh, record that as a color palette, or let's do one through nine at full. And I will do, leave it like it is, we'll fan it just a little bit. All right, say that's the color palette that I like. I can record that into my color directory. So I'll record that as color five. And then I can actually open up that palette. So normally, if I select the solo washes, if I say all solo wash, if you look in my color directory, it's actually grayed out. And that's because each uh, different fixtures are given different values. So it was recorded as a per fixture palette, which means other fixtures can't get the data. So if I wanted to use that same arrangement of colors, then I can open up that palette. So I'm going to hold down open and touch it. And then what I can do, same thing, just like I did earlier uh, in the programmer, I can do that to the palette. So I can say one, three, nine copy to 101 through 118 enter oops 
another row. One through a nine, copy two, another one through, and then eight, enter. There we go. Uh, and now I've actually taken the values of pictures one through nine, and I've copied them into 101 through 118. Uh, now, this palette has not been updated yet. I know that because the top it says modified. If I press the update key, I've updated that palette with the new information. And then now if I select my solo washes, that 101 through 118, I can now actually apply that color to all the pictures go to full. There you go. So that works for various different functions, positions, colors, effects, anything like that. So a lot of times I will create a bunch of palettes for some fixture types, and then I'll just make a macro that copies them over to the rest of my fixture types, especially if my fixture types are changing. Cool. Um, there's a question about budding and segment settings are equal. So if budding and segments are global and not specific. They are global and they stay on until you turn them off. So they will apply to whatever your fixture selection is while you have the, while you have those settings turned on. You know, um, you can go into, I believe it's your programming settings and actually put reset segments and budding on clear. So when you clear out your programmer, it'll reset back to turning being off. Yeah, I usually have that setting on. That's my preference. So Alan says, how do you make the macros that I just described earlier? So uh, to record a macro, uh, I'm not gonna do it just because it's a it, it's actually kind of a longer topic. There's a lot that goes into recording a macro. Uh, but essentially what I would do is I record a macro that says one through nine, copy to 101 through 118, enter. And one through nine, copy to 201 through 207, enter. And one through nine, copy to, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and those are keystroke macros. So it actually is recording the keys that I am pressing. And then I would go into that macro and I would uh, make it run faster so that it, I, the whole thing runs much quicker. So I'd actually like wait for the system to actually process my key presses. It runs it really quickly. Uh, and at the very end, I just update it and then I'm golden. So a lot of times I'll just open up a palette, run the macro with the macro finish, uh, open up the next palette, run the macro again, so on and so forth. Sorry, go ahead uh, to Q&A's here. Yeah, Billy and Wong uh, asks, what's the difference between touch and suck? Uh, so that's a pretty good question. Uh, so we're going to cover that up in the next video. I'm going to cover it now anyways, just briefly, just so you can kind of see the difference. So I'll go into the programmer window. Uh, I'm going to clear out my programmer, and I'm going to, there's a couple of cue lists that are kind of just built into this show file already. So I just push my faders up, and I've got some values on the stage. So what's the difference between touch and suck? So what touch does, let's say one through nine, say touch. And if you look in the programmer window, see how it pulled values for every single parameter. So that's what touch does, it touches everything. Whereas what suck does, so if I say one through nine, and then I hit the suck button at the bottom of the screen, see how now it only pulled in intensity, position, and then some gobo information. So what suck does is it only pulls in values that was deliberately programmed into what's being played back. So uh, if you look in this queue list, so uh, this first queue list here, if I open it and I hit uh, view queue, the values, these were the only values that were recorded into that queue. So that's what actually gets sucked. So touch and suck are just data management tools. They allow you to determine what data is pulled into your programmer and uh, whether you want to touch all values or you want to uh, suck uh, uh, specific values. You can also put a mask on front of that. So if I were to say through nine color touch, and I specify the color, the actual physical color key, it touches all things that fit under that mask, which was color. So I have only touched color values. Um, Osman's asked, how can you set up home slash default positions? So we covered that in the last video, but if you go to the fixture window, there's a button that says edit fixtures. 
And in this window, you can set your default values. I recommend that you hit the sort by function value so that you can choose what parameter you want to set as the default. So if I want to just go to my solar washes and set the default tilt, I highlight these cells, I hit uh, set, and I can type in a value, I'll say 45, enter. Now the default position for my solar washes is now 45 degrees of tilt. So if I say 101 through at full, they're already aiming 45 degrees out. Chris is asking about soloing the current selection. Um, so that that's kind of like the highlight feature, I would assume, where you just want to say what fixtures see what fixtures you currently have selected. Um, so if it turns on highlight, then you should be able to see which fixture the fixtures you currently have will be in red because we we manipulated our highlight palette. Usually, it's just an open by default. It's just an open white. Um, it'll kick out all color, beam, stuff like that. You can then also set a low light palette. That way, if there's other fixtures inside your programmer, they also do something different. Um, which I believe ours is set to like go to 30%, but that only works if they're inside the programmer at the same time. Right. Uh, there's also a thing called RIMDIM, so a little different tool. Uh, RIMDIM, fun fact, is actually disabled by default, uh, just as a kind of a safety feature so you don't accidentally press it and turn off a bunch of lights. Uh, so under programming tab, disable RIMDEM, I'm going to un undisable it, press apply. Now my RIMDEM key is highlighted, I can now use it. So if you wanted to solo just a specific light, so if I said, you know, five enter, and I say RIMDEM, I'll turn highlight off, it'll take everything else out and then just keep on the light that I have selected. Now it doesn't knock out the values, it does keep all the values uh, for your fixtures. But it just selects, or sorry, it takes everything that was active and just puts them all to zero. Cool. Um, and then, so Leo is asking if you create an effect for fixtures one through nine, can you assign it in different lights? I wasn't trying to avoid this. I was kind of hoping we can just talk about it in the effects, but I'll answer it slightly here. Um, it depends on what type of, inf well, it, yes, you can. I mean, it's the same syntax that Noah said. You select the fixtures, hit, co hit copy, and then, and then type in the other fixtures you want to copy it to and hit enter. Um, so like if you hit one through nine and then hit effect one, enter. That'll put them in the circle. And then you can say one through nine. Copy 110, 101 through 110, enter, and that'll get them copied. Um, so, yes, it is possible. So once again, using that macro, you can very quickly just copy values of one. Yes. Um, and we are going to go over more effects stuff in another video. We have effects video planned and a pixel mapping video planned. That way we can see it. Um, I have had a picture or two that had a gobo or prism and rotation when it's been highlighted. Uh, Alan says, so Alan, uh, talking about highlight again, uh, he has a fixture or two that has a gobo or prism rotation when it is being highlighted, how can you kill that? So that's that knockout command once again. So uh, we'll go into that intensity directory. Uh, I'm gonna open up, this is the highlight palette. And I noticed the highlight palette because it has a little H right here. So if you open it, so you hold down open and you touch it, uh, what you probably have is you probably have some value for a couple of your fixtures. So you probably have something like this where you, uh, some fixtures are told, hey, go to this gobo whenever you highlight. So that's where knockout's really handy. So what you can do is you can either press uh, beam and then press out the knockout key. Uh, you can also hold down backspace and press beam. You can also, in this program or window, a shortcut for knockout is if you highlight the cells and you hold down pig and you press backspace, that's the same thing as knocking out values that are highlighted in your window. So once you've removed that information, uh, you then update the palette. So I'm gonna hit the update key 
And then now you should remove that uh, information from the highlight palette. Um. is a physical key on the uh, keyboard or on the console. So the update key. Uh, you would say right whatever here. your color, so whatever your highlight palette is, because you asked which palette. Yep. So you would use the open key to open that palette and then you make your change, you remove that information and you press the update key to get out of it. Aaron asked, how do you see what your highlight or low light is, which highlight or low light palette is currently active? You'll have to go into each directory and then see which one has the H or which one has the L to see which one, see what your highlight or low light is. Uh, and if you can't find it, just pick any random pilot palette and set as highlight and click your highlight. And that'll just, if you can't, like if you have tons of palettes, just uh, uh, right click and hit set as highlight or low light. You guys can't see that, so switch over. So right click, set as highlight, and then clear the highlight palette. So if you can't find that palette wherever wherever it is in your show, you can just assign something and then clear it out. Eric asked if when, when a color is made in CMY, can we record it in a and here in sat saturation value in a palette? Unfortunately, we do not convert from CMY back to hue and saturation. Um, so there's not an easy way to take that CMY color mixing values to get it into hue and saturation values. Um, we do hue and sat first, but we do support going hue and saturation to CMY. So like if you were to pick a color in the color picker and then nudge your CMY, one of the CMY encoder wheels will co will convert that hue and saturation value into proper CMY values. We just don't go the other way around. Someone asked how to, what does fixture number and then dot do? Because we keep talking about these dotted user numbers. Uh, so if you had a fixture that had a master pan and tilt, like a master cell, um, so like the solo picks, for example, or hex and quad, I'm going to use high end fixtures here. Um, do you want to add like a quad for me? Yeah, I'm going to add one. Cool. We just don't have any in this show file specifically. Yeah. Um, so, and these aren't inside the visualizer right now. So once these get, once we get one added, we'll show you what exactly fixture dot does. A lot of hex. Hex so, works. So, so now that's the fixture. Yeah. Go so ahead, now that ahead. it's added. Um, we can see that we have our fixture numbers in here of 701 dot, 701 dot one dot through dot six. So if we just wanted to grab that master, that 701 dot, that is just the pan and tilt or like the master controls. That's when we can hit fix the dot button, enter, and that'll select just that master cell. Um, and again, just because it's dotted user numbers, we can go to dot six and grab that last cell in the, in the head. Or if again, go back to, to your master, hit dot enter, and that'll go back to your master. And that's that's what fixture and a dot button does, or fixture number and a dot button. If that's what you are asking about with fixture and dot. So just so you guys can see what a, a multi cell fixture is, this is the hex. This is the fixture I added. Uh, it's a multi cell fixture, so each of these little emitters has its own. Um, controllable LED intensity color, and there's actually a motor to move it left and right. So to get the master part, so that would actually be this the actual pan and tilt of the head here. That's where that dot is. So that's called the master of a fixture. Whereas the cells, the point one, point two, point three, point four, would control uh, each of the little uh, rings here.
Which command? So no, you want to take this one. Which command should we use for all fixtures at zero and home and faders turned off and faders off? Uh, yeah, so there's a couple different things involved there. So if you wanted all your fixtures to go to zero, uh, the question is, do you want that information in your programmer to be of zero or do you want everything to just be null? Uh, so what you could do is you could type in, say, one through nine, 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 enter. That's going to select all the fixtures that are in the show file. Um, what you could do is you can hold down period and press intensity, position, color, beam. And that sets all of those values to the default value. So everything is at its default home position. You can also record that as a palette and just click a palette. Now, that depends though. So do you want that information in your programmer or do you want that information to be null? Uh, if you have queue lists active, so I'm gonna press clear and uh, I'm gonna activate something in the uh, playback side of the console. So I'm gonna push these faders up. Uh, you could also hit pig and release. So holding pig and pressing the release key will release all playback. So stop all playback from happening. Um, it doesn't release HTTP faders. It doesn't release the intensity off of the HTTP fader. So if you're using HTTP faders, you do have to manually push those down. Uh, so it, it kind of depends on where the data is coming from. You can also create a macro. So uh, there's macros that can uh, push all your faders down. Uh, so there's a thing called a comment macro, which we're going to talk about in the video after the next one. We're going to talk about the playback video. And so you can make a, a macro that says fade master one slash zero, and it'll take master one and fade it, the uh, fader and set the value to zero so that you don't have to physically do it. You can virtually do it from the console. So it just kind of depends on where your data is coming from. So once again, clear, holding period, intensity, position, color, beam, or selecting the fixtures will take all of them to zero, but keep the information in your programmer and pig release will release all playback items, so all cue lists and all scenes. Um, Billy asked, when should CMY be used versus I red, I green, I blue? Would intensity colors be better for LED fixtures versus color mixing fixtures? I have strong feelings about this, so I will answer mine. Me too. And that is <laughs> to always use, uh, well, I don't use CMY, so I use hue and saturation, and then dial in white and amber as I need to. Because I would have to do the same thing for CMY. Um, I strongly it just kind of depends on what your color fades you you want, whether you use CMY versus hue and saturation. You always want to pick one and stick with it through your entire show, though. Um, so, like I said, I like hue and saturation, so that's what I use instead of I red, I green, I blue. The reason why I do that also is because if the fixture does not have I red, I green, I blue, then I can't color mix that fixture at the same time. So if I wanted my LEDs and my UNOs to be the same color, instead of having to go into my color mixing and mix my UNOs and then go into intensity red, green, blue to mix my LED bars, I could just do it all at once in the color picker and then fine tune it if I need to. Um, and then, so e ease of time, that's why I like to do it. And then also not all fixtures have I red, I green, I blue. And then finally, white, in theory, it shouldn't matter whether you're using CMY or RGB. Is hog CMY is just the inverse of RGB. So hog just converts those red, green, blue values to be the proper C to converts the CMY values to be the proper red, green, blue values that the fixture needs anyway. So in theory, there shouldn't be really much of a difference. It just kind of I'm gonna say it kind of depends on how your brain works. I would much rather use hue and saturation or CMY than I red, I green, I blue. And then um, I read I, intensity red, green, blue uh, also is an intensity parameter. So if you, uh, when I did that masking earlier, you actually have to record and hit intensity value, not record and color value, because it's actually an intensity parameter versus a color parameter. It also means that it's affected by the grandmaster. So if you push your grandmaster down uh, and you push it up in a new color, you're going to get that crossfade from white because your um, intensity red, green, blue values are controlled by the grandmaster. Uh, I 98% of the time use hue and saturation. I just prefer to control color from uh, two points, basically going from white. Uh, when I use CMY, it's usually because I have a very specific fan in mind. So I will, um, you know, do maybe some magenta and yellow and pull down fan. And maybe I just want to kind of shift my magenta around, you know. So that's really the only reason why I use CMY. But for the most part, 98% of the time, I will use hue and saturation.
Um, there's a question about can can we switch switch between two different positions, but not without a queue. Um, so basically, if you have two different, you, you can do this with fade change with fade changes turned on in the programmer. If you also have and you have like position directories or you have direct 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 positions you want to go to position palettes. Um, so with fade changes turned on, you can actually specify your fade time. So you could say like time five enter, and then you can tap on different positions and they'll take that fade time to go. Um, I, we're probably going to cover this a little bit more in our next video about um, palettes and using fade changes and all that good stuff live. So that's just an overview of how you could do it, though, really quickly. I've seen this question come up a couple times in Q and A. Uh, so, upon you asking a question about in shots, so uh, in shot is, is a fact question. I'm going to answer it briefly. I'm not going to showcase it because we we'll, can showcase it more specifically in the effect video. Uh, in shot is the amount of times that an effect repeats before it just stops. So, if you have an in shot of three, it's going to run three full cycles and then stop and then sit at whatever the base value of the effect is. That's what an in shot is. Does anybody have any uh, lasting questions? We're at right about the one and a half hour mark. Uh, so once again, uh, tune in to our next webinar uh, that we have scheduled. You'll get an email to click a link on that. Uh, if you have any questions, you're always more than welcome to email us. So if you want to get to us, you can get to us at support at highend.com. Uh, you can also email us. You can always call us if you have any questions. Uh, if you wanted to follow along with the visualizer and you weren't able to get it connected, uh, shoot us an email or give us a call. We can walk you through the steps on how to set it all up. Um, and then any other questions you have, just you know, email us or call us. You're more than welcome to. Uh, I haven't had a chance to actually peg Hog Factor yet. So if you're a student, so you're a college student, you have to be in college. Uh, you can be in your undergrad or graduate school. Uh, we do have a programming competition that is going on right now. Uh, the rig that is actually the exact same as the rig that you're seeing today. Uh, so if you uh, are, you know, you're in college and you can't uh, do much, you can program at home and you can actually submit either uh, as a team of yourself, as a team of two or a team of three to the hog factor submission. And if you place in the top three teams, uh, top three submissions, you actually can win a console for your school as well as several uh, prizes for yourself. So uh, last year we actually gave our capture donated some uh, capture licenses for pre-visualization. And we also gave the students uh, widgets. So uh, a lot of different options for you as well. If you have any questions about that, or you're a student, you can email me or Megan or support at highend.com and we can help you get set up for that competition. Uh, we also take the top three teams to uh, LDI in Las Vegas uh, every year. So uh, the competition ends in May this year, and then we'll pick the top three teams over the summer, and we'll take those teams to LDI in Las Vegas. Uh, there's two different hog factors, though. So if you're in Europe, the hog factor schedule is a little different than the American hog factor schedule. So uh, if you do want to participate in hog factor, you have to be uh, in the U.S. for the U.S. version. If you want to participate in the European version, you have to be in there's some different rules and regulations for that. All right. Um, and real quick, just one last time before we say goodbye, and we'll see y'all later, is that if you missed any of this or you want to go back, remember it's going to be posted on etcconnect.com slash study dash hall. Um, but, and so it'll be in there, probably in there in a couple days. Um, I'm going to put the link in the chat just to make sure you guys have it. Um, but again, it's going to be posted there just so that you guys can go back and review. Video number one is our, our last last week's video is already there. So make sure if you missed it, you can go back to it. Um, all that good stuff. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you everybody for coming and uh, stay safe and remember to wash your hands. Yep. Bye guys. <laughs>